and I'll share my screen so you can see it. All right. Now with the Zoom session, once you have it going, you can, through this more menu, is that where it is? You guys have different options than I do. But on this more me uh, menu, you should have something to um, go to minimized instead of full screen. And then you can move the Zoom section around out of your way and do all those great things. Somebody, what is it? You just press escape when you're in full screen. So It'll do it. Yeah. Do you guys hear that? Escape and full screen. We'll do it. So we've had a little bit of a chance to get to know each other a little bit. We're going to do a little bit more. If you would go to your people link, we've created a study group. Now this study group was just completely random. I didn't try to influence Canvas at all on who it put in which group. So this is a study group we'll use for a while. I hope that everybody has only wonderful people in their study group and nobody has any slackers, but you know how it always goes. Now you should be able to tell what study group you're in looking at the this group's screen. Whenever we set up groups in Canvas. Let's see if they got my touch working. Whenever we set up groups in Canvas, the group is given a home page. So let's go to your group home page. You guys might have done this a lot already. In the group home page, you can create announcements and pages and discussions and all of these things just for your group. Whoops, now the touch is working. So if you wanted to, your, your study group and you could create some discussion posts. So what do you guys think about this? And you could talk. But what we do have out there, or I hope I, that you have out there, is a document under collaborations. So look at the collaborations for your group and you should see an Office 365 document. This is notes. So let's open it. Maybe. Once you get it open in Office 365, we actually need to edit this document. Choose Edit Document and Edit in Browser. Never edit it in the desktop app for this document. The reason being, these are gonna be shared notes. So I want everyone in your study group to be updating this same document so that you guys are updating it at the same time together and you can share it. Now, when you get your notes in here, you'll be able to use these notes for the unit one exam. So it won't be an open book exam, but it'll be open note exam. So if you get notes that are good enough, that'll really help you. Now, some things about notes. When we're working with computer stuff, notes can be hard to write because we don't think that things are organized. But honestly, organizing things into notes will help you remember it. When you look through your textbook, you're gonna see chapter headings and things, and those are usually good things to use for outline items in notes. We want outline notes. You guys don't wanna rewrite the book. Last semester in Java 1, we didn't do this, but the semester before we did, and I'm gonna go back to it because it had worked so well. At the beginning of the semester, their notes were really not super helpful. You know, there, I, I would see like a, a paragraph of the book just copied, you know, like almost directly. Nobody was putting code samples in their notes. How do you know how to write an if statement if you don't put a sample in your notes, right? Because that's what your notes are about, is if statements. So all of those things um, that were being left out by the end of the semester, the notes were looking awesome and everybody was realizing, I want an outline of what's in that book. I want a few examples of some coding questions so that everything is there to go back to. But we don't want all that verbiage from the textbook or we would just rewrite the textbook. Now, another thing about notes is, this one time, way back, 
I taught a PC maintenance class and it was a summer class, so it was special. And it was for at-risk students. And if you don't know at-risk students are ones that have been recently incarcerated or had something else bad happen to them. So they were pretty bound and determined to be successful. They were like, we get this chance, we're gonna do good. And I said that they could use notes for their exam. I realized people were taking the practice test and they were copying test questions word for word into their notes. That's not their test too. <laughs> so, so be really careful because you do have practice tests and things available. Those aren't the things that we want to put in our notes. All right, let me get out of this one. Now, why am I talking about that? Because we're going to start talking about our introductory information to C-sharp. So it would be a good time to make some notes. Now, is it working? If you guys type stuff, can you see what other people type? I was just going to ask, sometimes when I need to like memorize like, specific terms, am I allowed to put that, or is that supposed to be your No, I would do terms and definitions for sure. OK. So That's those a are a really lot. good thing to put in your notes. Okay. Yeah. And for some of our chapters, terms and definitions might be almost all we can come up with. You know? Okay. And this first chapter might be that way, where we're going to have more terms and stuff than we would anything else. Now, if you guys are all laughing and giggling and sending each other bad messages, I'm just going to shut this down. <laughs> I can see Michael back there already causing trouble. <laughs> he wouldn't do that. <laughs> Perfect. Now, I'm in this group page, so to get back to the main class, I'll just follow the breadcrumbs at the top, and eventually I'll get back to the class with all of the links and out of that group. So be careful, because if you're in that group homepage, these links are not linking to the same place. I'm going to go into our modules, because we're going to get started there. One thing that we did not look at last time that the other class did, and I should back up and do that, is the student weekly timeline. I'm gonna bring this up. This is just a suggestion, but sometimes it's hard for students to get themselves scheduled, get into the mode of doing school. You know, I know a lot of people are like, I work Monday through Friday, so on Sunday afternoon, I can do all my homework. And sometimes that's the schedule you have to work in because that's what you've got. Our brains don't work very well that way. Our brains work better if things are spread out and they get a chance to kind of assimilate the information, build some indexes, do all that kind of stuff that we have to do in, a, in any good database. Our brain needs that time, right? So if we only do homework on Sunday, we're kind of hurting ourselves, making it harder. So I was thinking about how's a good way to split up the stuff that's in our class. We're learning a new programming language. It can be very intense. It can be a lot of work for people. So how can we handle it? Well, on Mondays, we have our new stuff that comes up in Canvas. So on Monday, it would be a good time to take an hour or so to just check What's on Canvas? What's new for this week? Review what's gonna be coming up. Is it gonna be a really bad week? You know, we have a couple of weeks that are tough. If so, how can we adjust the schedule? Well, just kind of get, get yourself familiar, excuse me, with what's gonna be coming in the week. So an hour or so. Then on Tuesday, be a good time to work on all the resources, watching any videos that are available, for instruction, read through the textbook, do some practice activities. For me, and making notes, so for me that would be a couple hours. Because as I go through that chapter, that's my favorite time to make notes is as I'm reading through the material. Because like I said, I'm gonna be looking at those headings in the textbook to help me make those notes. Sometimes when I get done with notes and I look back at them, I'll be like, Oh, I really didn't realize that that organization existed when I was reading through the book. So once I get rid of all the extra information and just have it as an outline, I can tell. So Tuesday, maybe a couple hours of reading, getting all the new information into my brain. Wednesday then, beginning the activities. I'd say two to four hours. 
some programming activities that I think are going to take 15 minutes can take one student two minutes and the next student 15 hours, right? So don't take 50 hours. If you spent that long, ask somebody for help, right? It's something small that you're not seeing and you need some help with it because there comes a point where you're just hurting yourself. So two to four hours on Wednesday. So that's a pretty big day. And that, this is nothing set in stone, just how I would do it. Thursday then, I take practice quizzes if there are any, look at other material that I need, any personal notes that I wanted to update, take a quiz if I need to. So I'd say it's gonna be another couple hours. Then on Friday, I already did my work on, on Wednesday. On Friday, I'm gonna turn it in. The reason I would wait that long is, for me, I like to sleep on things. I don't know if you guys are that way or not, but many times in my life, I've turned something in as soon as I got done with it, and then when I look at it again, I realize there was a terrible big mistake right at the beginning. And if I just leave it overnight and look at it the next day before I turn it in, I'll see that big old mistake and I'll fix it, and then I'll look a lot better than if I turned it in in the first place. And this is just something I learned about me in my very first software development job that no matter what I was doing, if I would turn it in the next day if possible, I would do better. So an hour or so to submit all this stuff. Now there's, there's bad things about doing that. You know, I could forget on Friday, think I have it all turned in because I did it all. So I have to really stay on top of things. That means I'm done. I'm done for the week. I'm done for that week for C Sharp. Saturday, I can just have a weekend. Sunday should be a day off. Monday, I can start over again with the new week. Now, why, why have things then in our class do on Tuesday? If we start on a Monday, everything's due the following Tuesday. Well, that's because technical problems happen. Life happens. Things happen that delay us and that put us off. So I want you to have that extra time in case you do run into some sort of technical difficulty or you go to submit and something won't work. So remember, these days, Monday and Tuesday, these are of the following week, these are like our emergency days, something went wrong days. So my intent is not for you to wait until this Tuesday and do all of this stuff then. Because if you do, and you already know how to program, it might not be a problem. But if you do and you don't know how to program, you'll probably stay not knowing how to program, if that makes any sense. Because you need to give yourself more time. So in the end, you'll see that you're gonna be spending Mm, three, four, five, six, you know, five to seven hours a week outside of class, on class. And I did a lot of research, and I found that's a normal amount of time that a student should expect to spend on homework for a three-credit-hour college course. Some classes, they say it should be a lot more than that, and some, of course, a lot less than that. But it is, it is a lot of um, responsibility. So some of you, you're probably, like I said, gonna get through all that stuff in five minutes and it won't even be a thing. But I want you to have realistic expectations and be successful because you're learning a new language, learning a new career. Give yourself the time and opportunity to do it well because that's what you want. All right, and let's go to modules. I'm not gonna ask if anybody has questions about that. I'm just gonna go on. <laughs> Okay, we've already done lesson one. You guys are finishing up syllabus quizzes. Great job. So we're into lesson two. That's for next week. So I'm glad we're to it because we don't have class on Monday. Right? So everybody gets a three-day weekend already. Everybody has a fun time. You guys got your notes. All right, looking at this lesson, a lot of your links are videos. Do you need to watch all those? No. Some of these videos are things that we're gonna do in class. So the video is out here just in case you want additional reinforcement, like you get home and you can't remember something that we did, you can look at the video. So they're not things in this unit that you need to watch. But if you wanna set them up on YouTube, you know, and just kind of run through them real fast and make sure that there's nothing that you feel like you wanna look at in there. We're going to do our first visual studio project today and look at some of these other things. So we'll get all this taken care of in class. Now, the videos that you do need to review are the binary things. 
So if you had a 120 class where you didn't get an opportunity to do a binary to decimal conversion, decimal to binary, the videos and worksheets in this folder will help you learn to do that. And that's a foundational skill that you really want to have. You're going to see test questions all over the place asking you to do those really minor binary conversions. So the only thing that you're going to have to worry about for this lesson is this assignment, the lesson to REPL course. I'm going to start on the lecture and I'm going to use this PowerPoint that's on Canvas. I already have it. I guess I must uh, not let PowerPoint keep track of it for me. Let's do it that way since it didn't want to cooperate. I'm the kind of person that likes to have hands on experience with things to learn how to do them. And I know a lot of people are that way. Let's see if this is going to work. Yeah. And so I know that lectures sometimes can be hard. It can be hard to follow, not give us the information that we want. So sometimes in my teaching experience, I've tried just not doing them. You know, let's just jump into the activity and see how it goes and let everybody learn that way. Because we all like learning hands on. It doesn't work very well. What happens is we're not really prepared. We're not ready to start. So even though they're not the best, they still help us get all lined out and on the same page. So let's look at this presentation, but kind of quickly, because a lot of it is stuff that should be review for everybody from their 120 classes and even before. So I'm going to let you look at the objectives and think about those things that you already pretty much know. Um, one thing that has really helped a lot our phones. Everybody seems to really understand the difference between system and application software now because of smartphones. We will today, we'll compile, run, build, and debug an application, or at least run it. We'll display some output, so we'll get that done. In the history of computers, you know, everybody gets to see this great information all the time. Remember that first computing device was the Abacus, mechanical computing device. And of course, I love Ada Lovelace. She was the first computer programmer, even before computers. We saw the use of transistors come about in the 50s, kind of right after Roswell. I'm sure it's a coincidence. Transistors. They all didn't think. And we're in the fifth generation now, does it look like? So we're seeing fifth generation of machines, according to this list. We're seeing machines that accept spoken word instructions, computers that imitate humans with AI. We definitely see global communications and wireless and mobile apps growing like crazy. So I would say that you guys will probably see that fifth generation split out pretty soon. Wouldn't you think we're kind of at another, another crossroads here where we're going to be leaving desktops behind and moving on into other devices and not really having this giant desktop anchor hanging around our necks all the time. Whenever you're working with your phone, like I said, it's really obvious what system software and what's application software. Keep that in mind when you're working with a computer. We know that if we do an update, to our phone, an operating system update, that system software. If we go to the app store and download something, it's application software. For our programming, we'll be writing application software, right? There are some companies that write system software, but the majority of software developers are doing application development. Now the operating system they mentioned here, it's more than just the operating system that impacts us is a software developer. And that's because different operating systems are going to include different compilers, interpreters, and assemblers. 
those things are what we need to make our code into something that's runnable. Here's a little binary blurb. It's actually showing us some machine language, some source code that's been compiled down to machine language that's ready to be executed by the processor. So when we're looking at programming, our kind of compiled development tools like C Sharp, Java, and Visual Basic, when we're working with a language like that, we have a source code file and then we use a compiler and the compiler translates that source code into that machine language so that it can be executed by the processor. How many of you had a 120 class that used Python. Is Python a language that gets compiled? No. So what do we call that type of language? Does anybody remember? If it's not compiled. I hear you. Remember? This is a good one for your notes. It's called interpreted. So in your notes, we want interpreted versus compiled languages. Whenever we run our program using Visual Studio, Visual Studio is going to do the compile behind the scenes for us. So that compilation is going to take that source code and make it into object code that the machine can run. When we use an interpreted language like Python, we don't ever have any object code saved. The Python interpreter reads each line of code, converts it to machine code, and executes it as the program is executed. So, we see a big difference in speed. If I have a program that's been compiled, I can run that object code now millions of times without ever compiling it again, right? Without ever going through that translation process again. But if I'm running a language that's interpreted, I am, I am going to be recreating that object code every time that program is run. That might not matter to me, but it might matter to me tremendously because we can see a huge difference in processing time over the lifespan of a program like that. So if Python is so much slower, why has it moved up to the top and is like the number one programming language right now? Because it might not matter anymore, right? Compiled programs, compiled languages. I mean, if you guys are running a game, you guys all want it to be C++, so it runs as fast as possible, right? You don't want it to be I mean, a Unity game. Oh, look at all those layers of overhead that are involved. It doesn't matter. By the time it's object code, it's object code. So it doesn't really matter where it came from. But we're seeing that our powerhouse computers doesn't really matter as much, whether it's an interpreted language and a compiled language. Another place that Python is getting used really heavily is in the scientific community, where they're not saving programs to run over and over and over. They're just setting up a model to run one time, and they're pulling um, atmospheric data from here and weather history data from here and other chunks of giant data from someplace else, and they're creating a one-time model to determine what's the weather going to be like next Thursday or whatever. So we see Python being used a lot for those kinds of things. So super exciting that Python has become so popular. So whenever we're doing software development, we are problem solving. We're, that's, that's why we write programs. That's why we write applications. We see a problem and we say, wow, I, I think I could write a program to solve that. So it's a process. So how do we start? Well, they've been asking that question since people first started developing applications. So there's a lot of different approaches or methodologies of doing that. One company might say, oh, everybody has to fill out form X, Y, Z, and then we're ready to go. You know, another company might do something completely different. But no matter what, if we're going to be successful, we need some sort of method of way of doing things that everybody agrees on. Now, this is another thing that could be, should be in your notes. Pick your fastest person. Because these are the steps in the development process. They should look familiar from your 120 class. Someone this morning said, aren't these the steps in like the scientific process? I think they are because 
that makes sense. We should do the same steps anytime we're analyzing a problem, trying to solve a problem. So in our software development life cycle, we're gonna analyze the problem, design a solution, code the solution, implement the code, which in this textbook means get rid of all our syntax errors and things like that. And then we're gonna test and debug. So here's a really ugly slide that shows a flowchart of all that stuff. The software development process is iterative, it's always ongoing. It can be hard for us too. We think that as we get to the end here and we are finally getting the desired results, the output that we want, you know, we're done, we're finally done. So this is a hard thing for us as software developers. When we're done with the system, we've been working on it for a couple of years, we've put a lot into it, we're finally done. It can be hard for us next week to hear about all these problems. And so we have to make sure that we don't get emotionally attached to our code, try to stay separate from it. Just think, that's great. They're already using it that much. Now they know they need enhancement. So it can be hard for us. Getting attached to our code is kind of a normal thing. I had a couple of students who were working for a company that did video games and I met them for lunch and one of the guys was like, this is a disaster. I hate it. He was like, this is my dream job. I should love it. I should be so happy. And I said, what's the matter? What's wrong? And he said, they never let us finish anything. Said, we get a call and the owner was kind of wealthy. And so he, he just had these people working for him at his beck and call. And they said, he'll call us and say, we have this great idea. I want you to start working on this. It's X, Y, Z. We're going to have this game do this. And he said, and we'll get all excited and everybody will get all involved and we start making a lot of headway. And then like two weeks later, he'll call and he'll say, put that one to bed. I have a better idea. I want to do this. And he won't ever let him finish it. This really bothered the one former student. My other former student was like, why? Why do you let that bother you? Just take the money and go. You're getting the code. You're going to do all this stuff. So it's really, really common. So all these things that seem like, well, die, it's so easy. Whenever it's in the real world, it can be a little tougher. Okay, they have all this stuff for all the different steps. I'll just go through them so you can look at them. We're gonna analyze our problem. We wanna know what range of values is valid for each input item. What type of values can we use? Um, what other kinds of things do we need? I worked on a medical claim system once that we went, I think we were two weeks into development, which is quite a ways when they realized that the, the five digit claim number they came up with was gonna be way too small. And so we had to stop doing everything and they had to go back through and change the database to make that a bigger number so that we would have more range in there. So all of these kinds of things can be really, really important. Now, after we've identified and analyzed everything, we're going to design a solution. When we're doing design, we want to use the divide and conquer methodology where we break things down into smaller tasks so we can assign different pieces to different people. Otherwise, it could be overwhelming and might not ever get done. So we want to make sure that we're um, doing that. If possible, we want to take an object-oriented approach. Some of you might know a little bit about object-oriented programming and some of you might not know any. That's okay because that's what we're going to do this semester is learn about object-oriented programming and really get into it. But when we're working with object-oriented programming, we think of the things that we're working with as objects. So in this object, I have a rental car. And for a rental car, I need to keep track of what kind of car it is and how many days it was rented for. And then I'm gonna have a method or an action for that rental car that allows me to calculate what the total charges were. So this is a class diagram. We'll be looking at those a lot more through this semester, but it's kind of documents an individual object. That class diagram is in the three sections. The top is the name, 
the middle is the data and the bottom are the actions. When we're designing, we'll use our tools from the 120 class, flowchart, pseudocode, any of those kinds of design tools. What we want in the end is our written algorithms. Now our algorithms, and again, this is something that would be good for your notes because they're pretty specific about what all our algorithm design should include. We still have step-by-step -step instruction for how to use this or solve this problem. The steps should be precisely given, simple. We should have a specific amount of time. We can't have an algorithm where we say, wait until you know, there's a green full moon or something like that. We need some sort of point in time that's meaningful to us. And if we sat someone down who knew nothing about this system and asked them to follow the steps of the algorithm, they should come up with the same results given the same input over and over. They should never come up with different results. We come up with different results in a desk check. We have some sort of logic problem. Finally, we're gonna code it. We're gonna use our source code. Now, Visual Studio is an integrated development environment, or IDE, and you might have used some integrated development environments in your Python class. Different instructors do different things. Some of us use the Visual Studio code. Um, there's PyCharm and all sorts of different IDEs available for Python. But an integrated dev development environment is a lot more than just idle. If you remember idle from the beginning of your Python development, all it was was like almost notepad. You know, it's practically all it gives you. Whereas an IDE is a full-fledged development environment that lets you code your source code, compile it, test it, debug it, do all those great things. Okay, here's a couple other things for our notes. With C Sharp, when we compile, first of all, the source code is gonna be checked for syntax violations. And then our code is not actually gonna be compiled into machine language. It's gonna be compiled into this intermediate language, IL. IL is kind of c -sharp specific, and it's in between our source code and object code. It's not really something we could execute. We have to have the .NET common language runtime, the CLR, to execute this IL code. And I'll let you put that in there because it's a little different than other things. A lot of these, like if you can remember what CLR stands for, the acronym, then it'll be easy to answer any sort of test question that you might run into about it. And if you go to some of the meetups that happen, those you guys should see bonus assignments in Canvas now too for things like that. If you go to a meetup, you know, there's gonna be people that like to spew all these acronyms. So it's really cool if you know what some of them stand for and you can say something back. All right. So when we go to run, .NET, which is kind of the environment Windows is using to run C Sharp, .NET is gonna load and then its CLR is gonna do a second compile, a mini compile called a just-in-time compilation to take that intermediate language and turn it into full object code in this platform. So why do I want to do that? Because this means now that I can take C Sharp code and I can run it on Linux, I can run it on Unix, I can run it on iOS platform. Because all of that intermediate language code can be compiled to machine language on that environment that's when it's running. That's all we go around. Mm -hmm. Like the original like C language was only able to run on Windows. If I'm not on DOS. So maybe C sharp to get it done 
videos there on other operating systems. Yes, I'm familiar with it. Just with the map, but that's close. C code C was actually developed under Unix by at Bell Labs, AT and T Bell Labs, so it was always available in Unix and Linux. Lots of good good stuff. Okay, so that's great. We got everything done. The last thing we'll do is test. When we're testing, it's important to plan your testing. Your test data has to include data that's actually going to test out the program. If there are places where you could have logic errors, like runtime errors in your code, we want to test for those kinds of things. Like you have limits. Say you've decided this number has to be between 1 and 10. You want your test data to have an 11, right? So you can see what happens if you have bad data. So our test plan is really, really important can be really involved and important. Have any of you ever been a beta tester or alpha tester for any game development? <coughs> you know they have a lot of rules. They want you to do specific things and report specific things so that they can know what's going on. So the better testing we do, um, the fewer problems we'll have. The rest of the presentation, they start, they start talking about structured Programming, top-down programming is kind of what some people may have done in their beginning programming class before you start learning about subprograms and functions and things like that. Those kinds of programs are really hard to maintain, so we try to use more functions. Should remember how to do the flowchart. I'm getting here. That's what I want. That's right, program. So I'm going to escape out of this one. And in the video for this that is on Canvas, there is um, a point where I actually create a really small C sharp program outside of Visual Studio and run it at the command line. So if you want to kind of Fast forward, scroll through that video. You should be able to find that section. We won't have time to do it in class, so you might want to look, but it's, it's not something that is critical. So I want to open Visual Studio. Now, I told you guys that Visual Studio 2019 was on the machine. Well, it's not licensed. So it's on there, but it's not ready for us to use. So we need to find Visual Studio 2017. So you might have to look a little harder to find it, but it is still there. Now I've already opened Visual Studio, so I'm not going to get all those startup things that you guys get. But I want you to look at them as they come up. First of all, you want to do, where are you? Okay, the first one is the sign in screen. You can sign in if you want, and Microsoft will try to keep your settings the same from here and at home. I don't sign in. Microsoft does at me. My you definitely can. So that screen, go ahead and go on past it, whether you sign in or not now. And then next it's going to ask you what kind of developer you're going to be. And if you use that drop down and choose C Sharp, Visual C Sharp, Visual Studio will set things up for you a little bit more. C Sharp oriented, but it's not the end of the world. Also, you can choose your theme. Lots of people like the dark theme. I'll stay with a light theme so you guys can see it, but I can switch real easy. Now, Visual Studio has the purple icon, and VS Code that you might have used for Python or you might be using in your web dev class 
has the blue one. And they're different. So Visual Studio Code is like a subset of Visual Studio. And it's a small chunk of Visual Studio that can run on multiple platforms. So I could use VS Code on Linux, I could use VS Code on iOS. Visual Studio only runs on Windows. So since we're running on Windows, we want to use Visual Studio because it gives us the most capability. Now, when we're looking at this Visual Studio screen, a couple of things that we need to think about and review. First of all, one that everybody always hates, what's this called up here at the top? I heard it. Title bar. bar, that's exactly right. You're like, why am I making you review this stuff from ninth grade? Because when you type stuff in on Google, when you're having a problem, if you can use the accurate names for things, you're going to find answers so much better. So maybe you have a problem with the way Visual Studio is handling your title bar of your new application. You want to use that exact term. We want to make sure we're really specific in our searches. So what's that underneath that title bar called? I hear it. What is it? Menu, menu bar, menu bar. And then what's underneath the menu bar? That one a bunch of people said before. Is that the ribbon? Do I? I said, is that the ribbon? That's the ribbon or the toolbar. And, and even Microsoft is inconsistent about that one, what they call it. So yeah, our toolbar and our ribbon. Now, some other things that we have on Visual Studio that we might not always have. Down here at the bottom, you have a status bar. Do you see mine says ready? Notice that one because that's where you're going to see some syntax errors and some other things pop up. And if you're not used to even thinking about that status bar, you might miss those. And then in between the screen here, we have all sorts of windows and tools and things that are available to us to do our development. Right now, I'm looking at the start page. And the start page gives me links to Microsoft articles about Visual Studio, gives me links to my recent programs, create new projects, it's got the open menu, has all sorts of information. Now I have another window here, the Solution Explorer, that's blank, and it has a tab down here where I could click and go to the Team Explorer window that is also blank right now. But we can see, well, not quite blank, We've got a lot of different tools. So let's create a project. I'm going to use the file menu and I'm going to choose File, New, Project. If I was working with Python, I could just create a file, right? And I would create a .py file and I could run it and that would be fine. When I'm working with Visual Studio, I am not going to create just a file. I'm going to create an entire project structure. So it's gonna have a folder that contains several pieces of source code and lots of other stuff. So I wanna create a project. Now in the new project window, again, you can see that things, we have a lot of options. If you scroll up, you'll see that we're in the installed Visual C Sharp templates. If we clicked around, if we decided that, I don't know, I'm gonna go down to other languages, and you decided that you're in the C++ class and they're using that, I don't know, got off a bloodshed compiler or something. So you decide, well, why can't I do C++ and Visual Studio? You could, so you can just change this. So you have all of these available templates to you. Now, I'm gonna stay pretty much stuck on Visual C Sharp for our class, but you're welcome to explore. Our first application is gonna be a console app and I want to use the .NET framework. Once I've decided what template I want to use, I'm going to set all of the information up for my application down here at the bottom. I want this project to be Hello World, and I'm going to name it 102 because I already did one this morning, because everybody's got to do a Hello World. Now, the next thing is the location. Where do I want to save this project? Mine has this really, really long path. But if you notice, right here, after my username, it's going to my OneDrive. So I'm okay with that. 
let's make sure yours is going to your OneDrive. Click on Browse. The reason that Visual Studio is trying to send this to the C drive is because the C drive is going to be the fastest location on this computer. And that's really where you want your code is on the C drive. But the way our environment is set up, you might want to save it to your OneDrive and then you could get to it easily from home. So I'm going to click on my OneDrive, my Documents folder, I guess my 150 folder, and then I created this SP20 source folder. So I'll select it. Good, you feel like you found a good place? Okay, if you're all set with all of that, we're ready to click OK. Now Visual Studio is going to create the project for you and give you some default code. So here we have some C sharp code. So right here in this part of the window right now, I have my source code. Uh, the Solution Explorer has a little bit more information in it than it did before. Okay. So this is an actual c -sharp program. If you look at that source code, the first thing that you probably notice are all of those curly braces. Right? c -sharp really likes curly braces. So you get used to them. So curly braces are kind of like the beginning and the ending of the paragraph, if I look at it. So here in the middle, this is a function, and we'll be talking about how all of this code gets developed, but for right now, we're okay to know this is a function, and this function is named main. And whenever I start running a C-sharp program, it always looks for my main function to start executing. So that's where it's gonna begin. Now my main function here, has this curly brace to begin it and the next one to end it, right? So all of the code that I want to put in this main function would go between those two curly braces. My curly braces are going to be my beginning and the ending. Now that function, my main function, is part of a program. We use the class statement in C-sharp to pull all these pieces of our program together. And this class statement also has a beginning and an ending curly brace. When we use Visual Studio, Visual Studio likes to really keep everything organized in a namespace. So our namespace has a beginning and ending curly brace. All we're gonna be working with most of the semester is the code within that program class. As a Visual Studio C Sharp programmer, you hardly ever mess with the namespace. So that's just something that's just always there. It's like the beginning, you know. And then the class name, we'll get into that in a few weeks, but for right now, let's leave that alone. So what we're concerned about with then is our main function. Let's do a little bit here to this to see if we can make some errors before we make code. Right now, my cursor is sitting right past that opening curly brace. So I'm gonna press backspace to delete that curly brace. I'm gonna wait for a second for it to find all of the syntax errors. Now it found a few, didn't it? So we can take our mouse and mouse over those red squigglies to see what kind of things we're running into. Mine says semicolon expected. That's not what we did. That's a little misleading, isn't it? If I look at this squiggly over the main, oh, it says your main must declare a body. So that's telling me a little bit I've got some sort of curly brace problem, right? And then if I come down here to this very last one, it says the end of file, I don't know, something about the end of file. 
that usually means there's a curly brace problem. Yeah, it should have found it. So I'm gonna put that opening curly brace back in. Now, notice when I typed it, Visual Studio popped in a closing one. I've gotta get rid of that, or now I'm gonna to have too many. So be really, really careful with the curly braces. When you're looking at this and you're looking at these curly braces, you're like, it's not a big deal. It's amazing what a big deal it is for people. They start getting code in and those braces get out of, in, into the wrong place or an extra one gets added. You can see the error messages aren't exactly as helpful as we would like. So it can be kind of hard to find this problem. I've had people drop because of the curly braces. Often, often, sometimes people will just be like, they're just driving me crazy. So don't let them drive you crazy. That's you, you control them. Now, what else could I do here? I could roll things up in Visual Studio to see what is within this body. So what's in my namespace? What's in my class? Now, notice how when I roll up my class, I can see my beginning and ending namespace curly braces. So try different things to be able to find them. And we'll also install a tool to colorize them so that we can find them a little bit better. Now, I want to go up and I want to delete the opening curly brace in the class statement. <coughs> Are our messages the same? No, look, now it's just like, hey, a curly brace was expected and you don't have one. So sometimes it can really tell you exactly what's going on. Other times it can't. It just depends on what was before that error message. So I'm gonna put that curly brace back in and delete that extra closing line. The red, the yellow, good, good question. The squiggly red means there's an error. These yellow bars are showing that changes have been made that haven't been saved. So good question. Because yeah, there's so much going on on the Visual Studio screen. Sometimes I won't even think about different things to show you. So I've just made changes there by deleting and re-adding those curly braces and Visual Studio has that warning there, you've made changes. So when I'm working with Visual Studio, I'm always gonna use the save all option. I'm never going to just click save because save is just gonna save the one thing I'm specifically looking at. My project could have many, many other pieces that have been affected by my changes behind the scenes and I need to save them all. <laughs> now that I save, notice these change places so it knows it's been saved all right a few other things about visual studio and you know a lot of this is just microsoft stuff i have these windows up my source code for right now is in a file named program.cs you see that on our tab so this is a cs file which stands for c sharp and we're looking at program.cs now, if this file were to get closed, how would I find it again? That's a really hard thing for new programmers to do. My file disappeared. Well, I can go over here to the Solution Explorer. And in the Solution Explorer, it's showing me everything in my project. And down at the bottom here, I see that program.cs, so I can double click on it in the Solution Explorer and bring it back. Now that means the Solution Explorer is a really important window. So what if I close it? I'm gonna close it. It's gone. Now if I close my program.cs, I can't get back to it. On my View menu, I can say View Solution Explorer. It's up at the very top because it's an important window and it'll come back. So, in Visual Studio, all of our tools and things are on that view menu, but there's a lot on there. Now, what if I don't like the way it's organized? I'm gonna take my Solution Explorer, I'm gonna grab it by its toolbar, I'm gonna click and hold, and I'm gonna drag this thing out of that spot. Now, that'll create 
or make this little gizmo tool pop up. And I can use this gizmo to drop this window in a specific docked spot. So if I wanted to put it here on the side, I could drop it while I have my mouse over that aspect of the gizmo. If I wanted it to take up over my whole middle there, or I can just put it in a place myself. So that gizmo kind of helps me keep things all lined up and docked. Now, if I don't like the fact that it's taking up all this space on my window, I can unpin it. So if I click the pin, now my Solution Explorer is in a tab down here at the bottom, and I can just access it when I need to. So that a lot of people like to have it set up that way where it auto hides. Now, just like Office, if you don't want it to auto hide, you push that pin again so that it's pinned to the desktop and it won't disappear on you. Now, I don't like my Solution Explorer down over here. I want it the way it was. And because Visual Studio gives you so many options, they do have a way to reset. On your window menu, you can choose Reset Window Layout and that'll put everything back to the default. So that could be really important, especially if you can't find the output window to find error messages. Okay, so how are you guys doing? Everybody messing, trying some different stuff? Now, you have to know how to move all these pieces out because otherwise, how could you take advantage of you know, five monitors <laughs> as a developer like you need, right? And Visual Studio is the reason that developers have so many monitors, right? Because I could have my code window in one monitor and I can have, let me put everything exactly where I want it, so just perfect. So I want to put a line of code in this program to make it actually do something. I'm going to click right there at that opening curly brace in the main, and I'm going to press Enter to open up a new line to put this line of code. I want to just print a message, hello world, out to the screen. So I'm going to use the console class. I know that console is a class just because I've had that experience and chapter one of every textbook you find is going to tell you about it. But I want you to see how things work in C Sharp. Notice as soon as you type that word console and put the dot, it's turning that aqua blue color that just means that C Sharp recognized that as an existing class. So already by it turning blue, that aqua color, we know it's good. C Sharp has found it. It knows what to do with it. When I type the dot, IntelliSense pops up with all of this IntelliSense help. And we'll use that as time goes by. But for right now, we're going to ignore it. I want to use the right line function of the console. So I will type console.writeLine. The write line function requires an argument. And the argument that we're going to pass to it is what we want written. So I want to write on the console, hello, world. Now I'm ready to go, but I seem to have an error. What is it? Semicolon. Semicolon. Oh, yeah, put that in your notes. You got to have a semicolon on every line of code in C sharp. Now, I said that, you're like, you liar, right? Because I don't have one on this line of code. I don't have one on this line, this line. Anytime I have a body, curly braces, I won't have a semicolon. But any standard line of code. Okay. If you did put a semicolon on body would it not accept it right you would break it okay. now sometimes um they've just been making the compiler a lot small a lot smarter a few releases ago it wouldn't have caught that okay. until runtime and then you'd have had some weird problem so it is getting a lot smarter all right so i'm ready to run this now there's lots of ways that i can run it when i run it's going to compile it create that object code and execute that object code for me. In your toolbar, this start button will run it.
Now, what I saw, black screen popped up, disappeared. Do you see that same thing? Popped up, disappeared. Well, we'll fix it. Another way I can run things is F5. So try pressing your F5 key. Again, console screen popped up, disappeared. I can make the console screen stay if I use control F5. So try control F5. And you should see your message. Yay, finally, hello world. So when I use control F5, I see my hello world message. Then the operating system gives me this press any key to continue message. It's holding this console screen open for me until I'm done. Is there a way to run it directly from the command line? Yeah, uh -huh. if you watch that video, mm -hmm. yeah, and you won't want to, but you can. <laughs> yeah. I saw a meme last night where they were talking, talking about people who are finally getting away from the command line. So yeah, <laughs> we always go. We have come arounds and goes arounds. You know, every once in a while it'll come around and everybody decides you should do everything at the command line. And then it'll go back around to, oh wait, we should do things the easy way. Oh wait, you should do things at the command line. So it always changes. All right, for this one, that works great, pressing that control F5, but there's another thing we can do. So it's not necessarily a better way, but a, an alternative. I'm gonna use a console command to tell the console to wait until it reads a key. I don't need to read anything from the console, but this is just a kind of a hokey way of making it stay open until I'm ready to close it. So now I should be able to run this in any way that I want and the console will stay open. So I'm gonna use my start button. And you guys will see as the semester goes on that if there's an, a button or something available for me to use, I'll usually use that because people watching me can't tell that I pressed F5. And sometimes it's not convenient for me to stop what I'm saying and say that. So a lot of times I'll press the, use the button where you guys will use the keystroke support. That's all right. So now you should see your hello world message there all by itself. It's sitting there waiting for input so it's not gonna go away. Okay, so everybody's working? Working, working, working. Can you make it say hello to you? Or make it say hello, your name. Hello, comma, your name. See if you can break it. Oh, no, just make it output your name. So easy, so easy. <laughs> He's like, what? You don't want me to do that easy to think? Yeah. It work? Nobody trouble? No trouble at all? Guys are so good. Now I'm gonna mess with mine because I want to try. I want to show you a few things. I'll say hello. Now we tried a few errors. Let's try a few more. I'm gonna get rid of the closing double quote. When I do that, the, the development environment thinks my parenthesis and semicolon must still be part of my string, right? Because it hasn't got the close of that string yet. And then when it hits the end of the line, it can tell there's something wrong. I, you never closed that string and I got to the end of the line. So notice it takes it that long before it can tell. It doesn't think that you have a problem earlier. Mm -hmm. Do double quotes or single quotes matter or can you use either one? They do matter, and you use double quotes for a string and single quotes for a char data type, so a character What's data the type. A, string and character data type? a character data type is all these things that we'll be learning next chapter. So we'll talk about those next week. <laughs> all right, so what else could I do to try some errors? What if I forget my parentheses? I finally figured it out. Takes it a second, doesn't it? And on this one, it's pretty smart. Down here at the end, 
we are finally getting the closing parentheses as expected. Great. Any questions? So oh, good. Let's put a couple comments in here. So here is a comment. I'm not necessarily going to comment our code, what we did today, but I want to make sure we have a couple of comments in our code. Let's see. I can do slash star. This is a block comment. We can have all sorts of different, different ones. Good, good, good. Now I'm going to do a save all and close Visual Studio. And then I want you guys to reopen Visual Studio in your project. Make sure you can get back to that spot. And then that's it. We'll do something else. Okay, we're in lesson two. And um, I want to start in this REPL course. So before we can start on it, we need to make sure you have your REPL account created. So doo -doo -doo. REPL stands for Read, Execute, Print, Loop. That's why they named their website that. It is REPL.IT. So let's go there and create your account if you haven't created one yet and get logged on. And then once you're logged on, when you click on our link for the REPL course, it'll set it up correctly, maybe, hopefully. Yeah, just create a new account. And you can make your account whatever you want, but please make your name be your first name and your last name so it'll match up with the grade book. If you've got your account created in Canvas on Lesson 2, go into the Lesson 02 REPL course assignment, and right at the top is the link to enroll in the class. Now, after you pick the, click the link, you should see this REPL screen here, my enrollment, and here's that class we just enrolled in. So each of our lessons will have a, REPL, a full REPL class, just to keep them all separate so they don't get all mixed up. 
And let's see what REPL is. I'm going to click on this thing just to go into it. When we use Visual Studio, we use the Microsoft C Sharp compiler. When we use REPL, we use the open source C Sharp compiler. So this gives you an opportunity to use both of them because some people want to get out from under the thumb of oppression of Microsoft. So they want to use the open source compiler. So here you go. Either way, you can do it. Now, this one, I already did. Darn. Oh, it's okay. It's easy enough. So what REPL is, is just a facility where I can go out and create activities and exercises and things for you to try, little practice programs that you can code. You can code them however you want. Oftentimes your output just has to match the requirements. When your output matches, you submit it and move on to the next one and you're ready to go. If you run into trouble, you submit it and let me know and then I can see it and I can send you messages and help you get it all working. So it's a great facility because it lets us communicate back and forth without um, having to send code to each other and all that kind of stuff. I can see what you've done. I know what you're supposed to do. I can just send you a message about how to fix it and keep you moving. I used it a lot through the summer class that was only five weeks long. They did what we'll do in this 16 weeks and five weeks. And because of REPL, they were all very, very successful at it. They had to spend a lot of time on it every week. But they were really, really successful because they went through all of these activities and made sure they could understand. So for each REPL course, when you click in it, you're gonna see several assignments or activities for that course. So for this one, the first one is this Y REPL. So I'm gonna click on it. And this is how the REPL system works. It's got instructions over here. On this side, it has your code. And down here at the bottom, it has your console screen. So it has all of our stuff that we were looking at in Visual Studio in a little bit more condensed. Now, if you notice with the code, it has our main function. It has that we, in Visual Studio, our class is named Program, and in REPL it's named Main Class, but it has that. But it doesn't have the solution level because that's a Visual Studio thing. So this program looks really similar to the one we wrote. It says, hello world. That's about all it does. So let's run it. Bless you. you. Click run. And eventually you'll see your output, the Hello World output. It's the Mono compiler, not the Visual Studio compiler. So you can see your output. Now when you're using the REPL, if I've entered required output, you can also do this drop down and click Run Tests. And then it'll actually compare your output to the required output. In this case, it passed, because this is a sample one that you don't have to make any changes to. So let me exit that. So once it's passing the test, you just submit it. Now that it's submitted, I'm going to go back to the classroom and click on the next one. I've submitted a lot of requests for them to do a next button. They have not responded. <laughs> I keep making you guys go back and in. Okay, so this one, let's see what this one is. We've got some, co some code over there, some starting code. And, oh, it's almost what you guys already did. It says we want to update the program so it displays hello world, because right now it only displays hello. It's like two, so I'm going to leave this REPL with you, and I'll walk around and make sure everybody's doing okay with it. This one is due next Tuesday, but remember we don't have class on Monday, so I, it, it might be due the following Tuesday. You guys might be so far ahead, I'll have to move due dates off on you. We'll see. But let's just go through it and get it done, and we'll see how it works. So if you get done with this, you can sure get out of here, but if you're working on it, I'd rather you stay so that we can help with any problems that you might run into. Everybody found it. Yeah, I 